Yeah, thanks, Candice. It's a real pleasure to be here today. For me, I usually speak to a healthcare audience, so um, just listening to Steve's talk, there's a, and also as a sort of startup founder, you don't really get out that much, so it's really good to hear other opinions on people who are working in a wider audience. I, I'm here really, I think my message today is about enthusiasm for a new audience, which is the patient audience. Um, my background is I'm an orthopedic surgeon, and I believe so passionately um, about this new audience that I gave up my career to start a social network. Why is it exciting? Well, I think it's exciting because, just as Candice says, medicine really came out of religion. Um, and I think one of the big moments of change in medicine previously was the change from essentially religious to a scientific practice uh, during the Enlightenment. And I think right now a moment as big as that is about to happen where the focus goes from a sort of scientifically and uh, institutionally driven model to a patient-driven model. So, but there are a few peculiarities about the patient audience. Um, it's very new. It's, it, although it's the oldest, probably demographically, audience on the web, um, if you're talking about chronic disease, our population of people is, is, is two-thirds older than 50 and a third older than 60. So it's a different audience. Um, but in some ways, it's the youngest audience because we've never really had a mass audience of patients before. This is a new phenomenon. We don't know really what to do with them. So if you speak to anyone from the pharmaceutical industry or from um, academic or clinical medicine, it's a very difficult thing to grapple with. Um, but for that reason, I think it's also the most exciting in many ways. Um, and uh, are we going to get? And, and and in some ways, it's also sort of the riskiest audience. So I think if you, if you speak to most people about disrupting industries, um, it's pretty exciting to disrupt the photographic or the video uh, industry. But if you're talking about disrupting healthcare, that's something that people get nervous about. So it's important because it touches every one of us. We are all patients, if not now, in the future, and all of our loved ones equally are affected by that. Um, I'm just going to go back to the beginning. Um, so when you hear someone like Vinod Kosler, who's one of the most famous VCs in California, talking about in the near to medium term future, 80% uh, of what doctors do being replaced by machines as a sort of exciting phenomenon, I think it may, most of us feel a little bit uneasy. Um, but on the other hand, what we know, I think it's fairly common knowledge now that we're facing essentially a healthcare crisis where we've got an aging population who are getting fatter, and they're getting less well, and they need more care, and we don't have the resources to deliver it. So we're looking to other routes to be able to deliver that. And in some ways, the activation of the patient audience and an intelligent activation is, is one of the things that people are looking at, how we can, how, how we can maintain healthcare in, in the new environment. And we all know it, really. If you, anyone who's been to the GP recently and tries to book an appointment or get their um, uh, medicines delivered or anything like that, it's still very hard. We're still behind the times when it comes to um, the use of digital and the engagement of audience. And 60 or 70 percent of um, preventable uh, diseases, of preventable deaths, are essentially caused by detrimental health behaviors. So there's a huge opportunity to change the way we do health by engaging with the audience. And there's a new metric in healthcare, which I'm only recently aware of, but which makes a lot of sense. It's called the patient activation measure. And it's a way of measuring actually people's um, uh, self-perception on how they engage with their health, how they engage with the health services, and how they engage with health information. And what's interesting about that is that actually it correlates much more closely to the outcomes of people's health than the traditional correlations, things like socioeconomic um, status or the, actually their, 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 their background in, in, in knowledge. Um, so this is the traditional activator, um, and this is the environment I grew up in. It really didn't change much from my generation to my great-grandfather, grandfather, and father, who were all surgeons. Really, it focuses on validity of information. And from the first day at medical school, you're taught about really identifying a body of knowledge which can deliver credible, valid information. 
What it doesn't focus on is actually, and what you're never measured on in medicine, is on how, how you engage with your audience and how, what the impact of that engagement is. And when, when you're talking about helping people help themselves, those two things are equally important, if not more so, than the validity of the information that you're doing. So what's, what's the challenge when we move forward for those healthcare practitioners is, is this is, we surveyed recently the amount of people in our um, network who use um, clinical services and the, the most heavy use group so, went to a doctor about six, uh, sorry, 15 times a year, which, which equivalent to about six hours of face time with a doctor. So that's, when you're looking, if, if you break up the year into six hourly chunks, that's the amount of contact you have to, with your audience as a healthcare practitioner. Whereas obviously people with living with a chronic disease, that, that is the reality of living with a chronic disease like rheumatoid arthritis. It's, it, it never goes. It's, it's there, it comes up, up and down, but it's essentially always there. So how do you get a six hour kind of face time into um, essentially a permanent state of, of living? Um, well, the answer is, it's not just hard from a time point of view, but it's hard from an actual engagement point of view. So, um, the Royal Society of Medicine did some research with, which is looking at all the, the literature around engagement and retention of information from a, uh, from a consultation. And between 40 and 80 percent of all information goes in one, out, in, in one ear and out the other. So um, there are factors that determine it, such as if a doctor's got a, a, a sort of worried look on his face, which, which would probably I would find quite distracting as well. But um, there, are, there, are, there are other things uh, as well, whether it's written information given, um, what the social status of the patient is, and, and so on. But the, the important thing is that how you provide information to people has a massive impact on, on their outcomes. So we surveyed, and I'll try and keep these um, graphs you know, to a minimum, but. We surveyed 2,500 people in our network about, who, all of whom have chronic disease, about what, uh, what they were given at the time of diagnosis. So what was that engagement with, with the audience from the healthcare professional? And by far the, the most common outcome was that no, nothing at all was given beyond the, the verbal communication. Um, then second most important was information. Um, so traditional sort of leaflets and things like that. But when you're talking about the sort of new opportunities with the audience in healthcare, things like um, connecting with other people with the same condition, which is what, kind of what we do, um, or devices or applications to help you monitor your condition, you're talking about one, one in 20 or one in 10 people, so almost nobody. Um, yet, when, when you then ask those people whether they're satisfied with the management of that health, if you look at this graph, it's sort of essentially yellow is good, red is bad. People who are offered no information whatsoever, essentially have 50, half of them are really dissatisfied with the way their disease is being managed. Yet when you see them, you know, if you, if you connect them with other patients or even give them information, it goes up to either three quarters or nine out of 10 people being satisfied with the way a condition like rheumatoid arthritis or vasculitis is being managed. So, Again, moving into how we engage with that audience, I think it's a really, really important thing, not just for the user, the individual, but also for the healthcare and society as a whole. This is another interesting thing, just in terms of what, what is the role of the, you know, the evolving role of the healthcare service or doctors or institutions, and what is the role of, of, of patients and peers that we get in a new sort of health audience. And this is research done by Pew uh, Institute a couple of years ago. And unsurprisingly, when it comes to um, things like diagnosis or treatment, 91% um, of people say they trust a doctor or a nurse to give that information. I'm surprised about, I don't know what 5% of people who, who would prefer to be diagnosed by another patient um, think, but you never know really. So, and on the other hand, it's not surprising that from an emotional point, support point of view, uh, only 30% would trust their practitioner, but 60% other patients like them. Um, but I think the interesting thing is the third one, which is practical day-to-day -day advice. The thing that fills that big spectrum that lie out outside the sort of day-to-day -day existence of your um, patient with a chronic disease. And it's almost equal in terms of the trust. So there's, again, a huge opportunity to connect people in a, in a kind of sustainable way um, to help 
from a day-to-day -day perspective. And that's really what we see in our site. So I, I did a quick um, look this week about you know, comments that, that might be relevant to this. And we, uh, you know, it, this is a group um, for, with a disease called Raynaud's disease, which is a, um, um, a vascular, um, uh, vascular disease. Um, and you, know, you can see from this comment, it's, it's about coping because there are other people here knowing that they can rely on expertise. So the importance of these key opinion leaders within this environment is, is just as important as you know, the, 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 the key opinion leaders across more general media, but also that they're always there for support and encouragement, which is um, not something really the health system is set up to deliver, but which is really important. Um, so when we're looking at one of the fundamental kind of values that a new audience can uh, provide, it's, it's connections with other people, just in the same way um, that exists in, in, in Facebook, Google, and anywhere which has changed from those connections being possible. The, the difference really is that healthcare information is, is much more specific, much more coded, there's different languages in it. So not, those media don't necessarily provide that granularity of context. So when you're diagnosed with something like chronic lymphocytic le leukemia, which is a blood cancer, um, the natural place you would go would be uh, sort of to Google. And you would probably find very quickly uh, uh, information within Google that, that directs you to this place, which is a support uh, association for that disease. They host a community on our platform. There's one and a half thousand people with that same condition that, can, that you can connect to. And there's contextual information about each person on that platform. Um, and, and so when you then maybe just being diagnosed, you run, a, you, you, you run a search on diagnosis and you'll find 500 stories about that particular situation of having just been diagnosed with essentially a rare disease and you find that information very easily. Um, and you'll also be able to find polls which have been set up, again, not by healthcare professionals, but by other people on the things that really matter to them, the things that resonate. So not only that, I think the, the importance is also about personalization of that information. So something that in the past, uh, content media sites for health have, have been able to provide top level information, but when it comes down to sort of granular information about my particular set, set of symptoms, my comorbidities, what different diseases I have, um, there hasn't really been a system to be able to do that. Um, Google can only really operate with the level of information they have about you, which again isn't, isn't really usually a lot of granular health information. So being, being able to identify my particular health interests and, and know that that information will be directed to me when I need it, um, that's, that's important. So again, going back to the importance of relevance, relevance for someone who's at the beginning of a, 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 a disease like chronic lymphocytic leukemia or the sort of end stages of the disease is, is going to be very different. And what, uh, what Google has done is provide relevance across a very broad um, spectrum of audience. And, but what Facebook has done is create a social graph around the information that we have as personal individuals. So I can find out who of my friends have eaten sort of pizza in New York in the last six months, um, but I might not be able to find uh, that information uh, elsewhere. So, what we've done really is adopt the same approach, but within health. So we've built a, 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 an intelligence which is very similar around the relationships between not just different users, as it might exist in Twitter, but also the different things that people are talking about um, and the different symptoms, the different treatments, and the different conditions that people might. So if, if I look at me, that I, that based around all the information that I've generated, I, that, you know, there, might, there may be a post that I particularly need that I wouldn't be able to find elsewhere. There may be a patient who's been through exactly that same situation. And there may, may be a piece of research that has been brought into the platform that is also most relevant. And that approach of creating an audience which is informed not just by the content, but by all the information that uh, r r you know, surrounds them in, in, from a healthcare context, that's really 
you know, only really just happening now. So healthcare really is about 10, 15 years behind every other industry, and partly because it's been driven by an institutional approach, not the consumer. And what's exciting about this is, is, is that for the first time, a consumer kind of web situation can drive, drive the information that's being driven to patients. And, and how does that manifest itself? Well, I think it's really exciting that when you see a publication in the New England Journal of Medicine on a, a drug called Prodaxa last year, um, that that spikes an interest in the audience in, across four different communities in health or not. So you get a massive spike of conversational. People bringing in information, um, people talking about it, critiquing it. And that's not just interesting for the patients, it's also interesting, I think, for the wider health care system. Um, it's, it's interesting for the people who produce the drugs, the, the people who administer the drugs, and the people who take the drugs. It's also interesting from a research point of view, the opportunity of having a very engaged patient audience. Um, there's a huge sort of international crisis about drug development and how you get um, patients into clinical trials, how you accelerate research. And, you know, 72% of our population are interested in participating in research, whether it's from, you know, developing clinical services better to uh, developing um, uh, new drugs, so clinical trial recruitment, or whether just sort of analysis of the market and how actually people take their medicines, people interact with each other from a healthcare perspective. So, but this is probably the biggest one, I think, which, which is maybe underestimated from a healthcare point of view. 47% of the population in our platform say that they use clinical services less because they have access to other people, um, you know, 24 seven. I think the opportunity of, you know, taking a proportion of the healthcare out of the system and into the consumer supportive environment in a safe context is really the one that, need, that, that is the big opportunity for, you know, for society as a whole. Um, I would just, I think I'll sort of close really by saying that the, the opportunity with a, this completely sort of fresh new audience is, is really quite enormous. The, whether it's trying to connect directly with um, people who you know, live and use healthcare, um, you know, either infrequently or, you know, 24 seven. The, the ability to, you know, identify the needs of those people as individuals is really only just emerging right now. And so traditionally going back to the start is, is the doctor was always that person who identified need. And we're moving to a, a world in which the needs can be identified, not completely, but in a different way. The, the, the kind of human needs of people can be identified quite clearly. And how you interact with that audience at an individual level or at a group is really, I think, where you know, everyone who connects in healthcare should be thinking. Um, how, how am I going to kind of, is it, am I going to deliver applications that can help people manage their health better? Am I going to learn from that audience and develop my products and services better? Um, it's, it's a question, I think, that everyone should be thinking about, in the, in, in, if not now, in the near future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, does anybody have a quick question? Okay, Nick. Thanks very much. Nick Jones from Visa Europe. Uh, we work in financial services. Um, you started off with a priesthood, you became a profession. It's highly regulated to prevent harm being done to patients and to, and to achieve a, a good outcome as well. You're being disrupted massively. How do you stop harm occurring within the peer-to-peer -peer world? It's kind of a question about reg what's the future of regulation of, of, of this, the dangerous stuff you play with? It's, I mean, it's a question we get asked commonly. It's the first question that gets asked, and I think the regulations that are in place are, are fit for the old world, and uh, the, I mean, the short answer is that the, the, the community, just as in every, across everything, 
the community often regulates itself from a risk point of view. Um, so when there's, a, when, when there's a dangerous, risky comment that comes up or, or any activity, it's, it's picked up almost instant, instantaneously by the audience itself. Um, the, we, 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 our whole model is around um, credible consumer sort of leaders, as it were. We, we, we all of our organization, uh, sorry, all of our communities are run by patient organization that provide that sense of sort of moderation and curation and the safety of it. But in terms of actually breaking through that and um, working with pharmaceuticals or institutions, that risk is still a big barrier to entry. So we focused on really just enabling the consumer audience and, and essentially waiting for the world to, to, to connect to that. Okay, this one over here. Hi, uh, Graham Cole. Do you see things like the iWatch and mobile technology and the use of mobile phones as a challenge or an opportunity for Health Unlocked? Um, my belief is that a platform, you know, if you, if you told someone from Goldman Sachs, a president of Goldman Sachs sort of 15 years ago, that everyone would, uh, you know, their whole work, 25,000 people would put their sort of CVs onto a open forum that could sort of reveal a huge amount of information, they'd tell you to sort of jump off a bridge. LinkedIn sort of did that and has dominated a, uh, a space of recruitment and, and, and professional kind of networking. My belief is that, 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 that we're, we're yet to see what platform dominates health and a single platform will come through. I've put my money on social engagement being the factor that's gonna drive that sort of glue, as it were, in, in, in engagement. I don't, I don't think that sort of device or metrics will drive that sort of glue and that actually a social platform will, will dominate. Um, but we'll see. Uh, I'm skeptical about the iWatch as a, as a kind of game changer, to be honest. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Um, and Ross, we've got one in the back. Thank you. Hi. Is that, is that on? Hi. Daniel Schomer, um, I'm from a pharmaceutical company, so I found that very interesting. Um, uh, I've got two questions, kind of one following on from this gentleman over here with regards to, I guess, technology. Um, so to what extent are you looking to integrate um, technology, so wearables, um, with your site? Um, and the second question is more pertaining to uh, the, the wider stakeholder audience. So in terms of uh, caregivers and, and the broader uh, uh, social network and support, how are you looking or in what way are you integrating that to make sure that it's kind of an all-encompassing, uh, I guess, holistic approach to supporting the patient? That's a really good question. The first one, um, I haven't sort of gone into it, but essentially, if you go to our site, it looks like a social network, but actually what Health Unlocked is, is the intelligence behind it. So um, in terms of connecting applications, what, we, what that kind of graph approach to who you are as an, as an individual is trying to do is identify the needs that you have based around what you look at, what, you're, what you create, and all of those other things. And then, so putting applications, you know, let's say a, an epilepsy, self-management application that we, we're currently working on um, with a third party. It's a bit like creating a Facebook application that, you know, like Zynga or, or, or one of these games that, that interacts with an audience. So it's really absolutely where we're going um, and we're working on our first collaborations around that. And that's particularly where, from a pharma point of view, we see a huge opportunity with, a, with an industry that's looking to change, looking to move beyond the pill, as that sort of expression goes. Um, how how you find that, that well-profiled audience to engage with. Um, sorry, the, the other question was around caregivers, which, um, you know, at, at, the, at present, only about five to 10% of our audience is caregivers, but it's a, it's a growing audience and, and in, in many ways requires equal sort of support to the patients. So, yeah. Great, um, thank you so much.